or snow in Amber, and how fast would this change that, and uh, what to be aware of in general. Uh, I'm Marco, Marco W on GitHub and Twitter. Uh, I'm the founder of Simplabs. We're a consultancy in Munich, and we focus on these three things, Ember Rails and Phoenix recently, so if you need any help with that, then uh, just talk to me. And we're doing Ember workshops as well. Uh, you can go to that website uh, for details. Uh, so leaving that marketing stuff behind us, um, back to the topic. You recognize that that says auth star in Ember instead of an actual word. Uh, and that's be uh, because auth uh, in that context actually means two different things. Uh, first of all, you have authentication, with, uh, which is the, the process of verifying the user's identity, which you uh, usually do by validating their credentials. And if, there's, if those credentials are valid, then you assume that someone who knows those credentials must be that user. Uh, or you might uh, uh, trust a third party to do that validation, which uh, is the case when you allow uh, people to log in with uh, Facebook, for example, or Twitter or whatever, or LinkedIn, for that matter. Uh, and then once you have authenticated the user, uh, then comes the authorization step where you verify that that person is actually allowed to do or see something that they uh, request to do or see. Uh, but something you have to be aware of is that inside of an Ember app, you cannot actually do any of these things because the uh, source code is in the browser and the state is in the browser, so that's all accessible and editable by the user, of course. So uh, at any point in time, you might just fire up the Ember inspector and do that, and then you're suddenly authenticated, right? So assuming you have something like a session service or so that you, that you uh, assign to dollar E here. Uh, you could also like, assign roles for yourself or so uh, uh, during runtime. So the actual authentication and authorization always happens on the uh, on the the server side, on the API server side, which can do it in a secure way, actually, uh, and uh, can actually prevent access to data or modifications to data. And in the case that something is not allowed, which is uh, respond with a 4.1 response. So, so th th uh, that means that authorization in the Ember app itself is just only about displaying a consistent UI so that you don't display anything that the user is not allowed to see. And if they were able to see, it wouldn't work for them anyway because the server would re uh, reject access to the data that that uh, particular uh, uh, route needs. Um, so let's have a look at how we do that now uh, without fastboot. And the status quo is basically using token-based authorization, where the token is issued by the API server, or maybe you have a dedicated auth server uh, during authentication, and then it's injected into all subsequent uh, requests. In most cases, those will be um, Ember data requests. And, uh, so the authorization actually happens on the, the uh, server side. Uh, let's look at an example uh, for how that looks from, from the first request that uh, loads the application. So here we have the client, the app server that serves your, your HTML and JavaScript, and the API server. Uh, so first of all, of course, the client sends a request for the HTML file, which responds then with that empty more or less empty index um, HTML that just contains the script tags. Then the client files a second request to load those, uh, that, uh, uh, to load the JavaScript. Once that is loaded, the Ember app starts up, renders the page, and um, from now on takes over, and everything runs on the browser, of course. Then when the user logs in, uh, they would send some, some credentials to the API server, get a token in response, and then in all subsequent, subsequent requests would include that token with the request so the, the server can, can, can authorize that request and, and reject, it, reject it if that's not allowed. So that, uh, how does that change when we're using Fastboot? Uh, first of all, a quick recap of what Fastboot is. So the slogan is uh, progressive enhancements, uh, enhancement for ambitious web apps. 
And for now, that mainly means uh, that Fastboot performs the initial render of the page um, on the server side, and so reducing the time that it takes until the user first sees some content that's rendered. So it uh, basically makes the startup feel faster for now. Um, and then after the uh, JavaScript has downloaded the Ember app, uh, starts in the browser and everything runs as it would normally do without Fastboot as well. And that's also the, the progressive part, I think, because if the client does not have JavaScript enabled, then it, it would not, not start up the application in the browser, in the browser, of course, and all the links in the application that would usually result in route changes in the application would just result in requests that would go to the Fastboot server. Fastboot server would render that that, that route that matches that request and would respond with the, with the rendered page. So you could actually use uh, the application without having JavaScript enabled in your browser. Uh, so let's look at how the previous example changes when you have uh, Fastboot enabled. And here we are assuming that the user has already authenticated previously and is just reloading the page. Uh, so first of all, you have that HTML or the request for the for the for the route that 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 should then respond with the with the uh, respective HTML that goes to the fastboot server. The fastboot server would then load the data that it needs to render that route from the API server, just like uh, the browser does, including the token, of course, because that has to be authorized or potentially has to be authorized. Like you might have something that just allows reads from from anywhere, but of course we're assuming. Uh, that request requires authorization, then the page gets rendered in or pre-rendered in the Fastboot server. It uh, responds with that pre-rendered uh, um, HTML uh, file, and then you have the second request, of course, for loading the JavaScript, and then the application runs in the browser as usual. And of course, if the browser then reads any data, then it would include the token as well in any request to the, the API server. Uh, so of course, you recognize that the Fastboot server also needs to include the token in, in the request that it sends to the API server. So the question is, how do we get that from the browser to the Fastboot server? And we need a way to do that that does not require us to execute uh, JavaScript, of course, because when the, the request is being made, then that's, that's when you're reloading the page, so you have no way to like, execute any of your code. Right? Um, so what we would need is a floating session kind of, which ensures a singular execution context in the browser as well as in Fastboot, so that, that the response that the Fastboot server pre-renders is the same thing that the user would see when, when looking at that stuff and rendering the stuff in the browser, right? And uh, the good thing is we have the uh, technology for that since 97, and that's, of course, cookies, right? <laughs> Because as soon as you have a cookie for some domain, then it would always be sent with a request to that domain. Um, so the idea would be, if we look at that example again, to just store the token in a cookie that would get sent along with the request that goes to the Fastboot server, and then the Fastboot server, Fastboot server would just be able to read the token from the cookie and would have it to make the, the uh, request to the API server. Um, of course, there is one problem with cookies, in the EU at least, that you have to show these things, right? But uh, for those of you who, uh, who are in Britain, you can just thank these nice gentlemen who just <laughs> liberated you of that, of that stupid rule. <laughs> Although they are, not, uh, they are not actually going to do anything about that, but <laughs> at some point, you can probably remove those warnings. But there's also another uh, problem that would affect people in Britain um, as well for the long term. And that's the fact that there is obviously no document cookie in Node.js. So you, uh, you cannot just, just use document cookie to 
to, to store the token in a cookie and read it from that uh, because that would just not work on the uh, Fastboot server. So what do we do? The good thing is there is an add-on uh, called Ember Cookies, which is a cookie abstraction that works in the browser as well as on, on Fastboot, uh, providing the same API. So in the browser, it would just use document cookie, and on Fastboot, it uses the request response uh, object. And now I have an example that I, I want to show you that's available on GitHub. So you can check it out there. Let me just All right. So oh, come on. I don't want to reboot now. <laughs> um, all right. So the demo application is pretty simple. Uh, we have a private route here that requires login. As soon as I'm logged in. I'm allowed to access that, and when I reload, I get the same, um, get the, the, like, the actual private data. Um, let's look at the implementation for that first. So we have a session service uh, here that uses the cookies service that's provided by Emma Cookies, and we have a token property uh, here that just reads and writes uh, uh, from the cookie, and then uh, it has an is authenticated property as well. That's true if the token is not empty. So we assume that if the token is present, then the uh, user is authenticated. Then f uh, the for logging in. Uh, basically, when the user logs in, we just take the credentials, send them to the uh, server. If that request is successful, we get the token in the, the response, write it uh, to the session, so it's being written to the cookie through that session service, and then transition to the index route. Uh, and then, last thing is looking at the private route. Um, that just in the before model just checks whether the session is authenticated. If not, then uh, transitions to the login route. And in the model method, we just uh, load the private data, sending that authorization header, including the token, along with the request. So that means I showed you that earlier, that when we reload the page and are authenticated, we get a response, or basically in the request, you see that the uh, cookie is being sent, of course, and the response includes the private uh, data that's being fetched from the, the API server uh, by the Fastboot server, sending the token and the authorization error. So if we now uh, delete the, the, uh, the uh, uh, cookie and reload the page, then you see we are redirected to the login page via a proper 307 redirect because Fastboot uh, translates that transition to that happens in the before model of the private route into a redirect, into an, an HTTP redirect. So that's the example. So you see it's actually pretty simple to do that. as the HTTP only flag. And the idea here is that instead of, uh, uh, when the user logs in, instead of sending the token in the response for that request, uh, just uh, uh, sending an empty response and uh, setting, a, 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 setting a, a cookie that's not accessible for, for JavaScript. And then that a cookie would, of course, still be injected into subsequent requests because in this example, the, the Fastboot server and the API server share the same domain, like they run on the same domain. They, of course, also share cookies. So the cookie that the API server sets when the user authenticates would also be included in this request when you reload the application or load it the next time so that the Fastboot server can read that cookie, include it 
in the request to the API server and would get the, the uh, respective uh, response. Uh, yeah, like I said already, that has implications on your domain setup, of course. So basically, your, your app domain and uh, API domain have to be set up so that the that cookie that the API server sets would also be included into request to the app server. Uh, in this example, you have the app server run, running at um, app.com, the API server, api.com, so the cookie that the API server sets would not be included here, which means that Fastboot would not be able to include it in that request, and then the whole thing that, uh, uh, would just not work. Uh, so let's look at an example for that. And I just figured out the morning uh, that the code that's on GitHub for this example does not actually work, so I will fix that. But uh, like I have fixed it on uh, my machine, obviously, but uh, I haven't pushed that yet. And note that uh, in the same repository, just a different branch. So uh, what we have here, I'm running a um, engine, engine X here, so I can 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 properly uh, uh, share cookies. So it's uh, the same example. The private root requires requires uh, authentication. When I load that, then I see the private data. When I reload that, then I get the proper response from from Fastboot. So uh, let's look at the code for this real quick. Uh, here we, the session service is a bit simpler. We just have that um, that is authenticated property that just uh, reads and writes through to and from the cookie. But in, in this case, we're just storing whether the user is currently authenticated, yes or no. Uh, and then on login, it's uh, this is pretty similar to the previous code, basically, that just uh, sends the user's uh, credentials to the server. But the, the difference here is if we get a successful response, we just set the authenticated property of the session to true. And uh, we don't get a, a response body in this case. But the cookie will be there. Uh, we have no way to, to actually see it from the JavaScript code, of course. but we know that if the response is, is successful, uh, that response will also include the set cookie uh, header that will set that HTTP only cookie. And then the private uh, route is the same thing as, uh, no, it's not the same thing as before. The before model uh, is the same thing as before. And in the model method, we now have to have to do two different things depending on whether we are running in uh, in fastboot or or in the browser that 's something that might be possible to to abstract as well so that you don 't have to have to do that check for fastboot uh, in your code but for now you have to do two different things so if you 're running in fastboot you have to uh, read the token from the cookie right the fastboot server of course has access to that cookie. Uh, because it's not a browser, it's a server, so that HTTP only flag does not matter in, this, in that case. Uh, so we read the token from the cookie and just set the, the cookie header uh, that's then uh, being sent along with the request to the API server. Uh, if we are running in the browser, we just set these uh, with credentials properties so that, that the AJAX uh, request would also send the cookie along with the request. Uh, if we look at, if I log out again, and then we can have a look at the actual requests and responses. So, like I said, if when we log in, we just get a two or four response, no content, but the requests, the uh, response headers also include that set uh, cookie header that sets that token cookie uh, with the. HTTP only flag, and then if we go to the private data route, then you see it uh, requests the private data and includes that uh, that that uh, that a cookie holding the token in the 
our request as well. If we reload, then see that we get a, well, first of all, of course, the cookie is included in this request as well. Uh, we get the proper response from Fastboot uh, with that pre-rendered route. And again, if we delete the cookie, then it's a uh, 307 response uh, redirecting to the login route. Um, all right, so that's uh, one last attack vector that I want to talk about uh, quickly, and that's cross-site request forgery. So uh, as soon as you're using cookies, you might be vulnerable to cross-site request forgery attacks. Uh, what that means, most of you probably know, is that someone gets to gets to initiate request in like in in your user context without your knowledge or consent. So if you happen to have a, a bank account on bank.com and uh, do your banking stuff there and then never log out, and then you're looking at a page that has that uh, HTML there, then the browser would actually send that request and would send one million to the attacker if you happen to have the one million, of course. Uh, there are several mechanisms uh, to uh, prevent that, so that would not work for most banks probably, but it's still a potential problem. Uh, and of course, the, the, the point is that if you have a, a cookie for the bank.com domain, then it would be sent along with that request, right? So the user, uh, the server, might actually trust that authentication. Uh, or you might get an, an email from some friend that supposedly uh, uh, supposed to contain like some CR7 picks, but actually has that malicious link. Um, so the point is that when you're using the authorization he uh, header for authorizing API requests, then CSRF does not work uh, because the authorization header would not be be uh, included in the re in the uh, request by the browser. But of course, when you're using cookie uh, authorization, uh, then you might actually be vulnerable, uh, as that a cookie would be sent along with the request, of course. However, uh, CSRF uh, results in GET requests, so if you have a proper REST API, then that would not be such a big problem. Mm. But the more interesting thing anyway in this context is that, of course, the attacker could also initiate a request to the Fastboot server, right? And um, depending on, on what you do in your, in your routes on the Fastboot server, that might actually be a problem. Uh, the good thing is, for now, Fastboot only pre-renders, so it doesn't execute any actions that might lead to to, to undesirable uh, actions in that uh, case. Because actions uh, would, of course, require user interaction, which does not uh, happen in Fastboot. So um, uh, basically, what you need to be aware of, or what you should do, is to not perform anything potentially unsafe in before model, model, after model, because these things actually run on the Fastboot server. Uh, and if you have a route that in the before model does something you uh, need to make sure is actually initi initiated by the user, uh, then that's probably uh, uh, probably wrong. The good thing is you're probably not doing that anyways because these methods are basically just responsible for loading data, of course, and maybe redirecting or so. Uh, but the thing you have to be aware of is that you're now exposing a part of your Ember app via an HTTP um, interface, right? Uh, so to wrap up, um, you uh, use token-based authorization. You store that uh, um, either via the authorization header or via via uh, via a cookie, and you use in, in uh, 
in both of those cases, you're using a cookie to transparently move the authentication state and, and any authorization information that you have between the browser and the Fastboot server. Uh, in the case that you're using an authorization header for authorizing API request, you, you uh, store the, the token in the cookie yourself, and in the case that the, the uh, API server uh, sets the cookie itself when the user authenticates, then it, it will already uh, be there, and if your domains are set up correctly, will be sent along with requests that uh, then uh, are handled by the Fastboot server. And of course, you have to make sure uh, you're safe. So one last thing I want to say is you uh, uh, could, of course, implement all these things yourself, or you could... Uh, just use the upcoming Ember Simple Auth release, which uh, will support support Fastboot um, out of the box. It's hopefully going to come soon. We're uh, working on that. Um, yeah, that's it. Thanks.